Hello once again. Welcome everyone. If you don't mind, let's maybe wait another minute. How do you want to do it, Ibrahim? Uh, let's perhaps start because I think we have a full day and I think uh, just introducing this session, uh, some of the other uh, participants can join in between. Uh, so perhaps let's let's start. So um, as, as you know, this is a, um, a four day uh, train the trainers active learning course that we are uh, holding and you, you joined uh, for the second day when we will be talking about uh, EOSC portal and uh, colleagues involved in, in, in these um, sessions are Irina Kuchma, Daniel Thomas Lopez, uh, Milica uh, Shekusic and me, Irina vipauts Barvar. Uh, that are here, and uh, I would just like to present uh, some of the objectives uh, for the for the day. Um, we are hoping that you will learn about the benefits of uh, engaging with EOSC, uh, then to get familiarized with the information available on the EOSC portal and its uh, functionalities. Uh, also. Uh, be aware that uh, you know this is also a meeting place with other trainers, so please exchange information that you have, um, and we can use it further for the discussion. But also that you will be able to increase your confidence in providing training um, on EOSC. Another element that I would also like to point out is that EOSC portal is still under development. Uh, so be understandable and make sure you make others aware when you disseminate information about the EOS portal that it might uh, change. So uh, the project itself is updating the portal every few months with new functionalities. And we also recommend that you visit the portal often and get uh, familiarized with the current uh, status and changes that are there. Um, so things that will be presented today might change a bit in, in next months, but the idea uh, is still there. So that's why we decided to also put this in our uh, training course for this week. Um, so this is going to be the structure for, for the day. We have about two hours. Um, so we would like to shortly present um, EOSC and EOSC Future Project, and then talk about EOSC portal and its value. Um, then we'll have a bit of an icebreaker where we would you really value your comment back, um, what do I expect to find on the portal, and then uh, colleagues will talk about how to find resources and services. And the second part is uh, goes a bit more in detail, how to order services, how to do onboarding, um, something short on your score, then we also invited a, a speaker to tell us about their experience with, uh, with the help desk. And we would like to then finish with some uh, training tips. Um, haven't, hopefully, we'll have enough time for the for the discussion and the wrap up of the, of the day. And at this point, I would like to invite uh, Irina to tell us something about ESC Future in the nutshell. Thanks a lot, Irina, and welcome everyone. We're glad to see you today, and uh, we're here on behalf of ESC Future Project. And perhaps if you could go to the next slide. Uh, EOSC Future is um, strengthening and building um, EOSC core components. Uh, and, uh, as you saw, we'll be talking about them uh, later today. Uh, it also enables um, interoperability services and uh, exchange uh, data resources information with uh, other platforms, uh, the part which we call EOSC Exchange. So all this uh, strengthening the EOSC portal and EOSC marketplace and EOSC services are at the core of EOSC future. And maybe next slide. Uh, and the idea is to provide a user-friendly environment for discovering data, storing data, recomposing data, computing services, uh, supporting complex research workflows and um, integratable services, and all this happens uh, on the EOSC portal, in the EOSC catalog, and the EOSC marketplace. Um, and um, the idea is to make EOSC work and uh, support uh, more innovative research and services in Europe, more interoperable, more streamlined, uh, and really make it easier to reproduce data and uh, results. And maybe next slide. Um, if you want to follow the developments of uh, 
the EOSC future project and uh, EOSC portal catalog and marketplace. Uh, there is a link below on this slide uh, to the EOSC future roadmap. And that's uh, where you can see uh, how the portal develops. Uh, as you see, there are three stages of developments. Uh, so I guess we're now in between stage two and three. And uh, we'll be talking about accessing uh, EOSC resources uh, later today. Yeah, I think we can go to the next, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Rina. Now I'll stop sharing. And um, now I would like to invite Milica to share the screen and also uh, to give us some direct presentation coming from, from the portal itself. But didn't we skip some of my slides? Sorry. Uh, no. Because they also had a part about how we talk about EOSC. So let me see. Let's start sharing again. Yeah, sorry. Here you go. So sorry, a couple more intro parts are about EOSC. Because we are all trainers in the session, and maybe it's, it's, it's good to exchange some tips or how we talk about EOSC and EOSC portal. So what we usually do, we when we need to define EOSC, we point to this about EOSC page uh, on the EOSC Association website. And we talk about uh, EOSC as a web of fair data and services for science in Europe. And then uh, we list uh, EOSC benefits like uh, seamless access to content and services where common uh, AI being able to access data from various locations. And Milica will be talking about that today. Also being able to access and order services for storage, computation, analysis, preservation, and more. And then um, adopt interoperable standards uh, so that uh, different data and services could be combined. And then there is uh, help desk training and support to improve the use of EOSC and we'll be talking about help desk as well today. So that's what we usually mention about uh, about EOSC and then uh, we really like this uh, short video uh, from the EOSC pillar project why should you join EOSC because uh, we think it's it's a good resource if, if you need to present EOSC uh, quickly and interactively. And then usually we talk about EOSC benefits for researchers uh, and uh, on the EOSC portal, there is this nice infograph uh, how we can answer research questions with EOSC uh, and um, we will be releasing more videos about that where um, researchers will be talking how EOSC makes their research and their work easier. And, uh, we'll be sharing those uh, recorded videos with you that you can also reuse in your trainings. So usually EOS benefits for researchers, uh, we try to give a researcher perspective and research story and invite a researcher to share. Then the next slide, please. Uh, we're also building a course about uh, EOSC uh, for institutions, what institutions need to know and how institutions could engage with EOSC. Uh, and these are some of the benefits um, that uh, we uh, share when we talk to librarians, to research managers, to institutional IT departments, that it really helps to connect uh, institutional services and data to international research community. Um, it enables a single point of access to data, services, and tools for researchers from that institution. It helps to have synergies and collaborations uh, across disciplines. And I think this uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary aspect of EOSC is something that should be stressed. Uh, and then um, leveraging 
institutional and national investments and uh, adding value in terms of scales, interdisciplinarity and foster innovation. And then it's an opportunity to share resources and services, uh, to create this economies of scales when perhaps an institution doesn't need to launch a service if that institution could use uh, another available service. And the next slide, please. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, EOS providers uh, are the ones who are also benefiting from EOS. And usually, when we talk about providers' benefits, we just point to this page on, on the EOSC portal uh, benefits becoming an EOSC provider, opportunity to promote services, uh, ability to get statistics about. Uh, access requests uh, and also feedback from users. Uh, it's a platform where service requests could be managed uh, and um, interactions with users could happen. And also, of course, increasing visibility of services, interlinking services, uh, and uh, an opportunity to participate in uh, policy and services for development. Um, and okay, now we can move to Melissa's presentation. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Irina. And um, just to mention, I think Irina will not be able to, to, to join us for the whole time due to other obligations. But yes, Melissa, I um, think you can continue. OK, let's go on. First of all, I will. Uh highlight that in, during the first hour we'll be primarily dealing with the uh with the user's perspective the end user's perspective i assume that uh, most of your trainees are researchers and uh, uh these presentations uh, a few several few presentations will focus on on this perspective of researchers and the benefits for researchers. In the second part of the of today's training, we will be dealing more with the other stakeholders' perspectives, uh, especially the providers' perspective. So uh, there was an interesting discussion yesterday. The uh, EOS portal, what it is, there is a lot of confusion about, uh, about it. Uh, Shall we call it EOSC portal? Shall we call it EOSC platform? Shall it call it the catalog and the marketplace? What it actually is? EOSC portal is, uh, as, what, as it appears to an ordinary user, it's a website uh, on this URL, eoscportal.eu. Uh, and it is, is actually uh, the interface for all the effort uh, invested since uh, 2018, uh, when it was first launched but also from before, a few years before, that was focused, this effort uh, has been focused on uh, pulling various resources together, uh, re-evaluating, uh, uh, preparing them uh, for use, uh, adding value to these resources, uh, cataloging them, using uh, uh, the standardized metadata schemas to describe them. And all of this was brought together to this uh, to this website that actually has uh, very complex components, but you see it as a as a un unified website, and this is actually an entry point, a channel, an interface where you communicate with all this effort uh, focused on building the European Open Science Cloud. It is intended for all uh, what we call EOSC stakeholders. These are researchers, research performing organizations, library service providers. Uh, you can find more information about who the stakeholders are, but it is actually meant for everyone, even citizen scientists and even interested citizens. So what can you find there? You can find some meta information, what it is, uh, who, who maintains it, uh, how it has developed, uh, about related projects. You can even find a glossary that is quite useful, etc. You can find news. But what is uh, important for you as a trainer, and I highlight this particularly today, these are policies across Europe, use cases, catalog and marketplace. Actually, catalog and marketplace are uh, a segment of the EOS portal, 
this is a discovery platform that is integrated into the portal where you can find uh, services. And since a few uh, weeks ago, uh, you can find also other resources such as publications, software, uh, data sets, uh, and even trainings. And also there is a very important block that is uh, called information for providers, which is technically very complex because it includes not only the uh, help pages, the info pages, but also a very complex dashboard that providers can use to uh, onboard their services uh, there. Uh, so you can find some definitions here. I won't uh, mention them explicitly. Uh, you can find the links with each definition. All this information can be found on the EOS portal. So the training challenges associated with the EOS portal are actually uh, huge. Uh, the most uh, difficult thing is to explain something that is still work in progress because uh, changes happen quite often over the past weeks these changes there were cases when these changes happened daily and it's very difficult to for example make a presentation that you plan to reuse uh, and then you have to change it and update it constantly but there are also other uh, other problems the complexity of the information that is provided on the portal is immense and it's not always easy to understand this and uh, the documentation provided is sometimes too technical the terminology is used is not very transparent to researchers for example it's sometimes difficult for uh, technical people if they don't if they are not coming from a particular background so it's a it's quite difficult to translate this into uh, a human language and to uh, actually transmit this information to various types of stakeholders and users. Uh, also, this is inconsistent use of various terms such as portal, platform, catalog. If you remember a few years ago, we preferred the term portfolio of services marketplace also eosk so these terms are not always clear and sometimes even us who are trainers we are using them interchangeably and uh, if i say the eosk portal i sometimes mean the, the catalog uh, and the marketplace and it's not very clear so it's quite difficult and this is yet to be uh, to be resolved uh, what about the information that can be found there i will highlight only a few things and uh, from i should say my personal trainer's perspective. For example, on the EOSC portal, you can find pages with policies, not only the European uh, Union documents, uh, but also policies across Europe. Uh, this is very important because this information for all these countries that you can see is provided in the English language. If I remind you that three years ago, uh, we started uh, regional projects that covered uh, various regions of Europe. We had uh, a landscaping action at the beginning of this project. And for us working in regions uh, with a pronounced linguistic diversity, it was very difficult to locate this information because uh, this information is usually provided in local languages or local websites where you can't even understand the navigation on these websites, let alone translate this, uh, these policies. So providing these policies, for example, this is an example uh, of Finland, uh, providing these policies, uh, at least a summary of them in the English language is very important uh, for various stakeholders, for policy makers, but also for, for researchers. Another uh, thing that is especially valuable uh, as regards the EOS portal are use cases. This is something that has been there from the, from the very outset, from 2018, when the uh, portal was la launched. There are basically two types of uh, use cases, uh, community use cases and some more individual use cases or related to particular research groups. Uh, and actually, all of these uh, use cases showcase the use of a particular service or a set of services and uh, show uh, these use cases show how these services that could be found uh, on the EOSC uh, portal or the catalog and marketplace uh, actually helped resolve uh, a research problem or how they improved uh, someone's research. So these use cases are really valuable and uh, it makes sense including them in your training uh, because this is the language that researchers understand they usually uh, look what their peers are doing they they don't really uh, listen to theoretical explanations so showing them uh, what their colleagues have done 
is usually very useful when doing training. This is another type of use cases. These are EOS can practice stories. Just visit uh, the portal. They're very, very interested. And also uh, they are, uh, they have a particular, each of them ha have a structured format. This information is structured and uh, users can submit uh, their stories. There is a button and there is a form where uh, any researcher can fill out the form and submit their story. Uh, for us, uh, the most important thing and the most difficult to explain is the catalog and marketplace. This is actually a, a very complex discovery platform. Discovery platforms means that there is a database in the background. This database has different types of resources. So this is a list of resources uh, the, the updated list of resources since a few weeks ago. Until recently, you could only find services there. Now you have all these kinds of resources. Not all of them are harvested and present here. This is still work in progress. And there will be more such resources in the portal. But uh, they can be found here. And the structure is now more, uh, more clear. You can just expect that you can see the direction in which the portal will develop. These resources, this is very important, they're not hosted on the EOS portal. This is one of the most difficult, from my practice, this is one of the most difficult things to understand for researchers and other users. So these things are not hosted there, they're hosted on some external servers on uh, institutional uh, servers on, uh, for example, these are other services, for example, uh, data and software and publications, they are hosted uh, on Zenodo uh, or the metadata are uh, pulled from uh, the open air research graph. So uh, they are not, basically they are not here. And when you are doing what we call the, the onboarding, we are not uh, onboarding the services we are providing actually the metadata. This is why it's called the catalog, because the records here, these are metadata records, and you have links to the sources where these resources, uh, resources are publications, data, software services, this is the terminology used in this portal, these resources uh, are accessible through these metadata records. We call it marketplace because uh, not all the services and resources are uh, in open access. So sometimes you have to order them. We will explain this later today. Uh, and you have to submit a request or sometimes you even have to pay. So this is a kind of, of marketplace and you can also compare these services. We will also show this today. So you have menus that lead, uh, we will, in the second presentation, we will have a demo to show you how to access this. Another important segment is the information for providers. We won't go into detail today into this. There will be a, a, a specialized training for uh, providers, which is more complex. But actually, you have uh, the most recent uh, resource is this uh, providers hub, and this will be the central resource. Uh, also, providers dashboard is actually a service where providers log in and they manage their services, they have the metadata, uh, and uh, this is for it, and there is providers documentation. So some of these uh, uh, sections might be merged, might be reshaped, but basically you always have these links leading to the information for providers. So to make this story uh, more clear and accessible to you, uh, I will show how the EOSC portal uh, developed and what you can expect in the future. Uh, I made a series of screenshots uh, from the web archive, the, the Wayback Machine. Uh, I, I guess you know what it is. So and you have links in, links in the presentation so you can access these, uh, these pages as they have been uh, saved, preserved in the web archive. So this is how the uh, EOSC portal looked when it was launched. And you can see that instead on, of this uh, very complex discovery platform, you had a listing of services and you, you had these, these information, whether it is beta or in production, I will explain this later, what it means, but uh, the, the amount of information and the, stru the structure of the of information provided was different. In April, 2020, uh, you could see uh, something that is similar to, 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 to the, the appearance of the portal today. So you had this intro page, uh, the, the landing page of the catalog and marketplace. 
and uh, also this discovery platform this was searchable and these metadata records you can see them in the next slide uh, they they were very similar to what it is today the point is that actually uh, there was a metadata schema agreed and all the services that were uh, added to the portal actually conform to this schema so these descriptions are more or less the same uh, today uh, then in april 2021 uh, we had uh, some changes in the uh, landing page we got these nine categories and these six uh, these nine scientific domains and uh, uh, six categories uh, which are actually types of services and at that time only services were there only services could be searched and browsed uh, using the discovery platform in april 2022 we got another block that you can see today. These are suggested resources. Some artificial intelligence is used to suggest this. And as it uh, sa says, said in the documentation, uh, these recommendations, suggested resources are, are based on, on your activities on the portal. So uh, you should take this uh, moment of the work in progress uh, in your training. You should always be very clear about it and you should always say to your users that uh, the fact that it hasn't been finished yet because this is a process shouldn't prevent them from using the portal they can find relevant information there the, the information about the services is relevant and checked and also it's very important to explain the purpose of uh, changes to the audience and also to, uh, that they can affect these changes because there is a feedback button and they can submit their comments and uh, actually influence this process of, of changing and upgrading the portal. So in November 2022, this is the most recent update, you can see that you have eight scientific domains and you have uh, eight categories and these categories have changed. And as we are informed, these icons here used are just temporary icons, so this will change as well. If you want to learn more about the future changes, uh, uh, you can find the last week, the, uh, a very interesting conference was held, uh, the EOSC Symposium, and uh, you can find a link here where you can find presentations about uh, the future changes, uh, some of which will come very soon uh, of the EOSC portal. Uh, what's the value of the EOSC portal? So uh, what's very important to highlight, uh, this is not just yet another, yet another portal, yet another resource. The information provided there is actually curated, it is trusted and it's up to date. And uh, uh, there is a single uh, discovery interface. Uh, you will recognize this value as the portal develops. This is a single discovery interface where you can search for services, for publications, for all sorts of resources. You, don't, you wouldn't have to go to, to various places to find this information. Also, it's very important that uh, the, uh, the services that are uh, onboarded, as we said, that, that you can find in the portal, are actually, they have to meet some requirements. They have to pass some quality check, they have to have their policies and they have to reach, we will mention this later, some level of service maturity. So uh, if a provider invests all this effort in uh, ensuring that a service has this, this means that the provider won't give up this service, that, it won't, uh, that the provider won't drop this service. So using these services, you, you're on the safe side when you're using these services because you know uh, you have the, all the information, this information is transparent, and you know that some quality check has been performed. This is very important if you are a researcher. Uh, also, uh, the service encourages engagement. You have these use cases, you can submit your use cases. Also, uh, you have uh, news posts uh, where you can find uh, valuable information. I've also listed some, uh, some links here. Irina has mentioned some. Uh, I will just like to inform you that uh, we will be providing some specialized training courses and that you will be informed. So it's very important uh, to uh, uh, just keep track of these developments and actually to be uh, to have the updated information and to inform uh, Julie, uh, those stakeholders, the stakeholders that you're working with. So this is all from me for now.
for now. Thank you, yeah. Melissa. Uh, and uh, just uh, for, uh, to inform everyone, because we forgot to say it at, uh, at the beginning, we will be providing the slides of today. So uh, you will have it uh, possibly also with some of our notes so that you as the trainers can see what we were actually thinking. And the recording of these also will be available so that you can use it. Uh, there's a there's a comment in the chat, and I agree uh, that there's a, a lot of to, to to basically unbundle. So uh, it's a complex system, and it's also true. And this is uh, why we said that, that in ES future we are providing trainings to different stakeholders. It, it does matter whether you are uh, developing all of these from from one or the 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 other groups and you need to, to see how to explain it. So now just to um, keep you a bit busy, we would like to, uh, you to, to join us on, on uh, a Jamboard. And I would ask uh, my uh, colleague Daniel to, to share a link. It's in a chat and I'm going to, to share the screen. Uh, so we, we don't have that much work for you and I'm hoping you can see my screen now. Um, Yes, and I see people are joining in, in, in the Jamboard. Uh, so we have just just few um, work for you that we would like you to, to do. Uh, so one of the things is if you could take one of the stars that, that you see around, and I'm hoping we have enough because there are quite many of you uh, joining. And if you could put uh, your star in, in the level of knowledge about EOS portal so that we know uh, what, what's in, in the minds of people and how well they know uh, the EOS portal. As Milica was saying, yes, because portal is still in the development. If you're not a developer, probably you will not be able to, to be an expert. Um, but yes, let's let's see how, how this goes. Yeah, and I see stars are uh, moving. So I'll take another half a minute for people to, to add their stars in, in a table. Um, yes, and I see that, uh, that many of you know something about it, um, but the, the, the knowledge uh, still should, uh, should be improved. And yes, and as Melissa pointed out, we are going in this direction and we are hoping that uh, in ESC future, and also I should point uh, projects that are coming after that, uh, we will be able to, to serve uh, this community with uh, some more information about the portal and its components. So let me move to the to the second uh, frame. Um, so we would like to ask you what do you expect to find on EOSC portal? And what I would like you to do is on the left side to have a um, uh, possibility to use a sticky note. So if you could click on a sticky note, uh, then you can choose your color and then you can put some of the text here and I'll say data because I'm coming from data archive and yes you can also choose the size and the color I would appreciate if you could add some of the ideas here um, as Milita said also to to give back uh, to the developers and um, also to see which are which are the elements that we should um, work towards. Uh, so I see there are more use cases. I think use cases are always important, um, especially because there I, I see that there are not that many interdisciplinary um, studies being done. So it's um, it's good to to do that. And yeah. I see comments are coming. It's one of these elements in, in Jamboard that it puts everything on one starting place, which is really, really interesting. Um, but we see training materials and resources. I'll put use cases here, and then I put data together, um, resources and support. I think that's, uh, that's always uh, important. Um, yeah, trustworthy. Uh, service provider, scholarly papers. I think one of the elements that uh, that you could uh, get from presentation that Melissa had just now at the beginning is that we are uh, going to look into um, accessing metadata on on uh, different resources, uh, beat beat papers, uh, data, and and other services. And I think this is already 
really important uh, um, for us all uh, that we have this possibility and also as researchers that this is one one place to look into I mean, usually you know how to find things when it is in your domain, but if you're trying to do something uh, larger, more interdisciplinary, it's always a challenge to do that. And I think Portal is trying to overcome uh, this issue. Um, so if you want to keep adding, um, uh, the Jamboard will be accessible. I'm just going to move also think for the, for the third slide that we can do it uh, now and uh, Possibly we can go back in the discussion to comment some of uh, some of these that we have uh, here. Um, so one of the elements that we would also like to find, and it goes, I think, um, for, for different uh, presentations of this week, is what kind of a training and guides on US portal do you need? Um, I think what we what we noticed is that we need it for different uh, for different uh, groups. And uh, uh, just to say that the link to the Jamboard, if people still want to join, is in, in the chat. I'm hoping that everyone uh, can see it. Um, there's, a, there's a question um, in, in a chat. Uh, let me perhaps, uh, while you're putting things in, uh, try to read it. So there's a question, is there automated metadata harvesting at play in regard to publications and data sets. Um, so I know that there, there is being uh, something done in the back. Um, Joshua, do you want to, to comment on that? If, we, if there's uh, something already being discussed in relation to uh, CESDA data sets? Uh, Irina, uh, I will explain this during the demo, but currently okay. the metadata for publications, software, uh, and uh, other research uh, pro products and uh, also data sets. This information is currently harvested from the open air research graph. So they might be probably later other, we call them, them catalogs, uh, other uh, resources that will be harvested, but uh, I will explain this later. Th these kinds of resources are actually harvested. They're not, not onboarded directly to this portal. Yeah, uh, thank you, Melissa, for that. Uh, so let me. There was a question about curation. So for services, this is quite clear. There is a team uh, behind controlling actually this, uh, verifying the providers and verifying the first resource that is. Uh, onboarded, the first service that is onboarded by a particular provider. Uh, as for uh, data sets and publications, this is a bit more difficult. I, I can't say how this will develop further, but actually these data are harvested and uh, you have to, if you want to do the curation, you have to do cur curation at a source. So if you see an error in the, in the portal, you have to correct it at the source in your repository whenever. Yes, but uh, do also, if you see something, uh, I think uh, that uh, managers would be grateful for your comments. And just to add that in uh, some, uh, um, so uh, cluster specific uh, metadata, uh, sorry, uh, cluster specific uh, marketplaces, they are uh, specific editorial boards that go through every resource uh, that is putting, uh, being put there and uh, verify it and also ask if there needs to be uh, further description. So this is, this is being processed, uh, but it will also still, uh, yeah, take some time. But we try to put everything that is there, uh, as Milsa said before, that is verified so that researchers know uh, how to use it. So, um, because we are really short in time, Melissa, I'm going to give you back the floor. And uh, for, for everyone that still wants to, to add something to, to the Jamboard, uh, please do, because the Jamboard is open and we'll then add some of these back to the, to the slides that we'll be sharing with you. You are muted, Melissa. Okay, can you see my screen? Probably yes. Uh, yeah. I'll skip the slides. You have the slides uh, in, in the presentation. You will get the slides with all the links, but I would like to do a kind of a live demo 
so that you can see how to navigate uh, through the portal. Because this is this seems to be a challenge. This shouldn't be a, a challenge. You can just you know assume this hands-on approach and just go and click around uh, and and see what, what there is. So for policies, you can find policies there, and these are these countries. Uh, also use cases, you can find them there. I mentioned this, Providers Hub is here. So this is the landing page of the EOSC portal. You can log in. We will talk about this later. It's very simple to log in uh, because uh, you can use either your institutional single sign-on uh, if your institution supports it. If not, you can use your ORCID profile, your Google profile. This is called social uh, social login. So it's very it's very simple to log in, and anyone can log in. Uh, now I will show uh, one part uh, of the, only one part of the portal uh, that is uh, the most tricky, and this is actually this part: catalog and marketplace. This is this discovery uh, platform. So it has uh, a landing page, and this landing page has several segments. It has this top part with a search bar, with a menu, with a login, and also with my used marketplace that you can see when you are logged in. From this bar, you currently you can search services, not all the resources. I don't know why, why is that so. It will probably change, but at this moment you can search services. So don't get confused if you enter a search term and search phrase and you don't get uh, anything but services. So this is it. If you want to browse and search all the resources, you can go uh, here, discover research products and services all together. If you want to search only services, go here. If you are logged in and want to go, we will explain this later in another presentation, you can go also to your project if you're log logged in. This is a block with two tabs where you can select either scientific domains or categories, and you can go here to browse all resources. So if you select any of these, for example, if you want only research outputs, you go here and you get uh, practically the interface, but with discover research outputs checked and the search is actually limited to research outputs, which include data, publications, etc. So let's say that we want to browse all the resources, and this is the discovery platform. If you go here, you can see that you can search everything. You can limit your search, and you can actually put any search term here, and you can limit your search, but you don't have to. You have these uh, suggested uh, services or whatever. These suggestions are made based, uh, as they say, based on artificial intelligence and your behavior. For me, it's quite logical to see NIFO score services because I was searching for this. So, and you can see some filters on the left side. You have filters. This is more or less standard interface where you can limit uh, by choosing, for example, only data set. You can limit these uh, the the the, the, the results, the results list. And you can also clear these filters. Uh, on the results list, you have these tags. So if you want to choose, for example, only the services where order is required, you can click uh, and you can see that in, the, in this facet in, uh, in the filter, this is checked because the search the list is limited only to these results. So this is more or less intuitive how to use this. We will go through these, um, these particular elements. We call them resources, uh, resource types. So if we just limit this list to publications, uh, you will see that there is uh, about less than 2 million records. Uh, actually, yeah. And uh, you have a list where you have these, uh, again, uh, tags, open access language, publication, etc. You have access type, open access, closed, restricted embargo that are actually applicable to publications. So I have the problem with the page because it's a bit uh, responsive, unresponsive. 
Okay, so if I perform a search, what's in, I have to refresh, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for me. Well, this happens, uh, this happens uh, in the portal. If you have some add-ons that are not uh, quite suitable, they may block because it's still quite new, but okay, let's go to publications. I want to show you how a publication rec record looks like. Okay, so this is a publication. And you can see that this record actually looks very much the same as a record in the open air research graph. This record is harvested. These are metadata provided by the open air research graph. You can see these statistics that they are actually provided as well by open air, as this says, and these downloads and total views are not actually meant here, but those that open air collects and they are most probably from open air and from the source site. On the right side, you can see the, the source. So this, public, this publication is not hosted on the OS portal. It's actually hosted on another platform and you can access it here because this publication is uh, in, in the open access. If a publication is not uh, an open access publication, you will probably not be able to download it here, but you will have to use other strategies that you normally use to fetch publications that are not uh, in open access. So these are publications. The same applies to data sets. These records are quite the same as those for publications. So you see that this is also fetched by the open air research graph and this is available on Zenodo and if you click you can go there. Uh, the same applies to software and the same applies to other research products. All these things are fetched by the open air research graph. So for the services it's a bit different. The services have been uh, from the outset they have been here uh, they were listed, there was a catalog of services from the very beginning. So you can see that you also have these tags, everything is more or less the same, but these filters are adjusted to the, to the resource types. So you can see this is open access, this is order required. You don't have uh, the embargo because this filter doesn't make sense for this particular type of resource. And if you go to this, uh, to this record, this is also a metadata record about this uh, about this service. You can see who provides the service. You can see a description. You can see this is a service that requires order. This is not an open access service. You, there are multiple offers, so you can select an offer and you can actually submit. This is, in, we will show this. You can submit a request to use a service or to buy it uh, by uh, actually using the EOSC, uh, the EOSC portal the form on the EOSC portal. And you have the metadata actually explaining. These, met, these metadata conform uh, to a standardized metadata schema. So we had uh, project, regional projects, we had thematic projects, for example, like uh, shock project that created their own catalogs of services that are similar to this one. And actually all these catalogs conform to this agreed metadata schema. And the purpose of this action was to ensure the uh, interoperability of this catalog so that uh, the services <laughs> from other catalogs can be actually harvested uh, by the EOSC, uh, EOSC uh, catalog and marketplace. So if you go here and see the details, you will see additional metadata, you will see the geographical availability, the languages of the interface of the service, you can even see some use cases, you can see the pricing, and what is very important, <coughs> and what I meant to actually say when I said that these uh, resources are curated and that the particular effort is required to uh, qualify for uh, being uh, onboarded on the EOSC uh, catalog and marketplaces that they actually have to provide uh, 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 mandatory terms of services, privacy policy, but also most, most of these resources, they have a 
their manuals and their training information. Uh, these are sometimes, in some cases, these are courses that you can actually use to, to train yourself how to use a particular service. So the providers had to put this effort uh, into uh, preparing the service and preparing the metadata uh, for, for, for the onboarding. Another important thing is this TRL, technological readiness level information. This is very important, although you might not be able to understand every single detail of what it means. There are nine technological readiness levels and only uh, seven and up are accepted for the OST portal, but actually, uh, ideally, uh, eight and nine should be, should be onboarded. Uh, and this means that nine means that service is fully operational and it's actually working. If you're using a service that is not listed in a catalog like this, you found something on the internet, on, a, on an institutional website, some research group, uh, they have developed a service. You don't know the technological le level of it. You don't know uh, how operational or how reliable it is. So this is what I mean when I say that this information is actually checked and curated and somebody has invested uh, an effort into this. Also, uh, you will, uh, when, uh, in a presentation about uh, the course, the EOSC services, you will hear more about this segment, help desk, which means that actually, uh, if you need a help desk, if you need to contact a service provider, you can use a help desk provided by the EOS catalog and marketplace. So the provider doesn't have actually to create their own uh, help desk because this is a, quite an investment and effort. They can use, this is an added value to this service. And also the fact that this resource can be ordered through the EOS uh, catalog and marketplace actually uh, means the same. This is an effort that is saved to the provider, but also uh, this improves the user experience because the users don't have to handle many different interfaces to read the information on the, on the provider's website. They can just go here and fill out the form. You will see later when we will be talking about uh, uh, ordering services that this is done in a very, very simple way. So this is about, uh, about how it looks. I won't be showing the uh, the search. You can try it yourself. I would like to make clear only one more thing, and this is that uh, when you go to the uh, to the portal homepage, and you scroll, and you come uh, here to this icon, publish research outputs. Th this might be a little confusing, because. Uh, Intuitively, a user could think that you can actually publish your research outputs on the EOSC portal, or that you can, for example, uh, onboard or upload your publication uh, on the catalog and marketplace. This is not the case. When I click here, I will actually get a list of recommended uh, platforms, repositories, uh, where uh, I can uh, upload, deposit my research data or my publications, etc. And you'll see that this is Episciences, Nodo, V2Share, etc. So actually you get a recommendation and you can choose from these uh, from these actually services and platforms where you can uh, uh, where you can actually uh, deposit your data. There is another important thing relating to services. So uh, you can compare services. You can go here, for example, and if you want to uh, use us, for example, storage, you need a storage service, you perform search, you find these services, and you can select uh, a service. I go to services yes you can add these uh, services for example you can go here and i can add the service to comparison and i can also add other services to comparison for example this one so i and then i click i can clear this uh, selection or i can add more services if i wish and when i run compare 
these metadata that are available, you get a table and these metadata are listed and you can check, for example, that this service is generic, this one is intended for, it's among other things, it's also generic, what it actually does, who the target users are, you get information about the technological readiness level. Uh, you, for some time, for example, you have here, you can find open access services. So some of them are order required and others are open access and you can compare uh, the basic feature because before going to the to their uh, web pages and exploring further, you can get some basic information here. So this is yet another value uh, to these uh, services and also to, to your user experience. I'll stop here. If you have any questions, I can just, uh, just go into uh, more details. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there were some discussions in the chat related to the um, how the how the web of science uh, is you know complementing uh, these what is in the portal, but I think uh, also Vanguard put some of the answers here in the back. Uh, so we, we have a few minutes if anyone would like to also uh, ask question live or still uh, put it in a chat in relation to what uh, Milica just uh, showed us now. Irina, I think, I think I'm, I'm just trying to track the different comments and I think there are a couple that maybe were not uh, answered, so maybe we can, uh, I can... I can tell Militsa in case you Militsa want to add anything to it. Please go ahead, yeah. Um, so there was one from before from Armin that said that it seems to me that for training purposes, the first step is to unbundle all that and go there with a specific need and training aim. Just to pick one aspect, finding data sets, it only takes me 10 minutes to explain Google data set search to researchers. Um, here we need to make through a lot of layers of complexity first to get to that. I don't know, Milica, if you want to comment yeah. anything. That's a, absolutely the approach. Uh, I've been training about the EOS portal since, since it's appeared first. So uh, you can always explain something and you, can, you, can, you have to take into account the needs of your stakeholders. So it's, you are using different language and different terminology and different approaches if you're training providers or if you're training uh, researchers. Researchers don't really, they are, I work with researchers a lot, they don't really, uh, some of them don't really like new things. And they just stick to what uh, their colleagues are using. And you have to be very persuasive and you have to explain the value to them. And you can all, you also have, to be very efficient and uh, explain that this the service doesn't really uh, require great effort to use it. So these ten minutes, ten minute uh, explanations are the way to work with them. Okay, thanks. Um, then there was, I mean, there was a, a a comment about how the information in the portal will be created, which was already answered in the chat. Um, also about the meta <clears throat> the metadata uh, being harvested. Uh, then also there was a comment about this that this harvesting of the information would be an argument to have a separated website for the verified and curated services and another one as a meta search engine that is automatically populated. And it says this would be much clearer for users. Yeah, that's I, I a good that's... idea. Yes, this is a good suggestion to the development team. Uh, okay, then something about the RC archive login that was answered. Um, concerning publications, how is this portal complementary to Web of, Web of Science or PMC? And there, uh, Venkat provided the link to the Explore Open Air. So please take a look at that. Um, and maybe just, oh, I see a hand, a hand raised. So maybe you want to go for that? First of all, the coverage of, of the Open Air Research Graph compared to the Web of Science. PubMed Central or Scopus is much, much, much broader. Yes, Pauline, just go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, my comment was more like, I mean, this, this EOS portal will be useful if people that are looking for data resources, publication, softwares, 
will find an exhaustive list of what they are looking for. And that's a bit what we are facing at the moment. And I, I know it's a circle is that we, if we don't have a, something that works, people do not onboard. But at the moment, and I'm assuming I'm not the only one, we are struggling to get our providers to onboard because we have difficulties to sell. We have been asking them to onboard in many registries, many portals. Um, and as you say, we know that it's something in building, but we need to find the right moment when we ask when we ask them to onboard, because if they have difficulties in onboarding, we lose them. So for example, I was mentioning some issues, it seems silly, but issues in login to the portal. And already they are like, listen, I should not have to log in with my Google account. It's not normal. Um, this is annoying. <laughs> um, I and, and then we need to really sell them what are the benefit for them and and that's where we are a bit you know at where we are a bit fading in, in some cases um we are all struggling with this but actually what i always recommend is uh you have this feedback button <laughs> provide the uh, provide feedback button and uh it's always a good idea to submit some feedback sometimes technical people developing services they may not be aware uh of some issues because they are uh, looking at the services from a different perspective. Sometimes they don't really have, they don't have the opportunity to log in from different areas, from different networks, using different services. So providing this kind of, for example, you, you saw that uh, I'm having issues with my browser and uh, this is something that happens. Uh, and it's been happening since the new version of the portal has been launched. So this is something that should be reported. This is the point of the work in progress. Yeah, yeah, I fully understand that. It's just sometimes, I mean, a lot of our access providers actually tell us, you know, if people are using, looking for a resource, they, they, the way that they go is to Google it and they will have a response, usually very rapid, to find what they need. Um, so at the moment, our, our way forward is really a political reason why they should onboard. Uh, because there are political reasons uh, uh, to onboard to the EOS portal. But yeah, um, but the trust I'm just raising one, one issue that is coming our way. And if you. <laughs> In the age of fake, of fake news and, uh, and viruses and uh, spam, uh, trustworthiness is a, a good argument for persuading them. So finding a trustworthy resource where you don't lose time, when you don't take the risk of uh, having your computer crashed is, a, is an argument. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, Joshua, do you want to add something to this discussion? Perhaps? Yes, I wanted to uh, try to address the last uh, question when uh, the person was asking when onboarding to the EOX there are uh, mandatory fields that needs to be filled and that could be a barrier. Yes, indeed, it, it, uh, I agree. But I would like to share uh, our experiences at SESTA and to like extent shock how we're able to deal with some of these issues. Um, what we, we did was that we had the profile in an Excel sheet because when filling this profile, some of these questions or some of these requirements not only it's it's the service owner, if you may, or the person involved with the service might not be able to get all the answers to. So it is it's it's a whole organizational or institutional thing. So you get it into an Excel sheet, then there's then if there are questions where communicators or some higher people needs to verify, then they can add their input to it and get all those done before you go on onto the portal and you enter them. But if you go there, if you go onto the portal directly and then you are not able to get the answers to it, that's where some of this becomes a barrier. So what we tell our, our community, I mean, uh, shock is that you get it into an exit sheet, get all the money because not one person may be able to get answers to some of these questions. You will have to inform, involve, some other department, communication, things like tag lines, and then some uh, tech, you may not be able to get answers to. Then you have to consult some other people to get input. So once you get input and it's an Excel sheet, then you can now go onto the portal and transfer them into a portal, and that yeah. will make things easier. I mean, if we can do it this way, uh, we will not have a situation where 
people will only onboard providers and they are not going to onboard their services because they don't have answers to it and they get stuck. So this is what uh, I would I'd like to share. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Pauline. If you have a quick uh, comment back, otherwise we'll proceed with the with the event. Yeah, uh, maybe it's not the right. You will tackle the provider onboarding. So yes, I please. think okay. It's so I will, just, I will wait for my question. Sorry. Yes, uh, so thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, give the floor back to, to Milica to uh, to cover two of the elements. One is the um, ordering of the services, and the other is onboarding. And perhaps we can, after that, uh, have a quick chat uh, as well. Uh, we have one hand raised, and I would like to answer to Armin's uh, question. Uh, we should expect more uh, more resources to be harvested from open air because it's just the beginning. For example, I'm uh, I'm looking attentively at it to see, for example, some resources that I know from my local repositories in Serbia to appear there. It seems that most records that can now be found on the OSC portal are from Zenodo and they are harvested through open air. So we can expect this is, I mean, we, we should be patient. It was only two weeks ago or some somewhat more that these resources appeared on the EOS portal. So shall we proceed? Uh, yes, please, Milica. Okay, I will proceed with the presentation, but I will switch to uh, to demo. Let me share my screen. Uh, okay, so basically, uh, when you when you're ordering services, what what does it mean to order services? This means to actually get a service and use it. So if a resource is available in open access, you just uh, go to the to the metadata description of the service, you click the link and you are uh, taken to the resource, to a publication or to the service and you, you just use it. So if a resource that is publication, data, software or other, this, this stuff that is actually harvested through open air, if it's not available in open access, you cannot order it through the EOS catalog and marketplace, you will have to use the ordinary strategies, you ask your librarian to help you, write to the author, uh, trying to find, uh, try to find a, a green version deposited in a repository that may not be harvested by open air, etc. Uh, so if a resource or service requires ordering, which means that it is either paid or and it doesn't have to be necessarily paid, some, some service is available upon request. So they are meant for a particular research community and they are not shared uh, publicly. But if you are a researcher in a particular area, you can submit a request and access to the service and use it. You can place your order using the EOS catalog uh, and marketplace. Uh, there is a management system and uh, actually this is an added value uh, as i've already explained and you will hear, hear later more uh from the technical side uh this is an added value to to the services that you can actually do this from the catalog and marketplace uh so uh if you want to use the man order management uh, system you have to log in so you have to have an account and log in and you can actually use your institutional uh, single sign on or ORCID or as I already mentioned, uh, uh, the, the, uh, other social uh, social login options. So this is what I've already explained. If this is a publication, you just uh, go there, locate it. You also sometimes you have multiple versions and you can choose which one of them you actually need. And you just click here on this uh, green lock and you get there to the publication. So I'll now switch to uh, to the uh, to the demo. So for example, I need uh, a service and this service is uh, requires ordering. So I'll first log in to my account. So I will log in immediately, but you will usually see this uh, option to choose uh, from your institutional uh, login or uh, a social login. So I'm now logged in and I can see I have my account uh, here. And if I want to uh, order a service, I go here to the service and there is a button 
So we will have to wait a bit. There is a button access the resource. So I click here and then I get various options. So this service, normally services don't, not all of them offer so many options, but you have different packages here and you can select one of the options for each of these options uh, order is required. So I select an offer and then I hit uh, next. And then I get some access instructions. So this information here says how I should do this. Okay, I've read it and I go next step. And then I have to configure my, my request. So how many number of CPU cores I need. So I will just put some random information. Uh, okay, you have to fill, uh, fill in the, mm -hmm fill in the uh, mandatory fields and for example i want this to start from let's say how many days i will put 30 days and then i click next so i didn't fill all the fields i will say 20 okay so now i can review this uh, this information and I can add a project. So what is this project? I will show you this later. I've added one project. You, you can add projects to your profile. You can add multiple projects and you can describe this project and you can group resources uh, based on, uh, on your needs related to particular projects. So I've registered for the testing purposes, I registered an EOS future. I mentioned EOS future as my project. And I mentioned here also that I'm testing this in order to prepare training. I can add additional comments if I want. And then I uh, click, I'm not a robot, fix this. Okay. So these are not bicycles. So these are issues that you can encounter. Okay. And then I can just send an access request. I won't be doing this now because I don't want to bother the provider because I won't be using this resource, but this is an issue. And I send an access request and the provider is contacted via the portal. So I'm not going to the provider's uh, web page and writing an email there or finding a form there. I'm sending a request using uh, this portal. So I will show you this from my, uh, from my account. So if I go, I can't see it here, but if I go to the portal home, I will probably be able to access my account. No. Okay. I should be able to see somewhere my, uh, this doesn't work in this browser. I should be able to see my, uh, here, go. Maybe so. mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Let me just ask a quick question in the meanwhile. Uh, when you said that, um, if you order a project or you want to, uh, you send a request, the provider will be informed through the EOS portal. So, that means, is there a way, for example, to get a notification in your email that someone has sent you a message or something? Or do we rely completely on having to access the portal to see if someone has contacted us for anything? Unfortunately, I can't answer this question because I haven't placed a real order. <laughs> Because I, I I was just testing this and I asked the colleagues whether I could do this, so uh, we would we would need someone who actually ordered a service. So I didn't. I managed to order one of the services that was actually it, it doesn't require payment, but you just need to place an order. I, and I got access immediately, but I don't really have the experience with. Uh, with real, real orders. But this is something that should be covered. For example, a good, a good way to test this is to find a researcher who really needs a service and to sit with this researcher and just follow the procedure, make screenshots or make a video that's the right approach to, to do this. I, I can't still change my, my screen. 
yes, I see that we are still not uh, co-hosts. I'm hoping yeah. this could uh, be... Also, uh, another thing, this uh, there will be a kind of a user's dashboard. Uh, okay, so there will be... A, there, can you I think, hear me? Yeah, I think now okay. you are co-host, I think. Uh, oh, if, great, if because uh, uh, it says that I'm muted. Yeah, yeah, I think, okay. uh, yeah. That's so a... let's go to my to my project. Uh -huh. You can see my screen now. Yeah. So have you seen, uh, did you see how I got to, to this? Uh, so I said that uh, finding this My EOS Marketplace is still quite a challenge because it, this link is not available on all pages. And this will be probably available because some of these pages are not really updated. It's, it's a huge, huge website. So uh, the safest way is to go here to, to this uh, homepage of the catalog and marketplace. And you will have this link here if you're logged in, but also you can go here to your projects. So if I go to my projects, I access this. And I can see you can create a new project. So, for example, if you're working on any project, you enter the information about this project, about uh, the reason why you need some uh, EOS resources for this project. This is actually the basis for a use case. Uh, then you you can add the domains, the metadata about the project, and you create it. This project is created on your profile. It's not that uh, people can see the information about your project when you're ordering a service, that you're associated with this project, but this is actually your workspace, your dashboard. You can see this. So I've created this uh, EOSC future testing project for myself. And I have these details when I actually mentioned that I'm testing the service to prepare my training. I also have an opportunity to submit an email to uh, actually a message to the experts, EOS experts. And also I have here some resources that I uh, want to associate with this project. For example, this resource is open access and I pin this resource to my, um, to my project. This is done very simply. For example, if a service is open access, so if I go to services and find an open access service, for example, this one, and I can say access the resource, and I say pin to a project. I add a project. I don't really have to add additional comment. I can for myself. And oh well, this is really this really bothers me. Okay, and I pin it to my project. And when I go to my ser services. I can see that this is this is these are open access resources and also this this one is ordered that's the one that I actually ordered didn't require any any other confirmation it just I just got there so this is how you do this ordering so the interface we saw one one option the interface is not always the same it depends for example if I say I'll check this one because I know it uh, we saw a, uh, a service provider, a service that has many options, um, several options offered. Sometimes it's only one offer uh, that, is, that is available. And for example, if I want to order this service, I go there, I can see the instructions that are slightly different to, to the previous ones. And I actually just fill out a very simple form saying that I'm associating this with my project and I add additional comment. And when I send the access request, it should reach uh, the, the provider and provider can decide whether to let me use the service or not, or whether some pricing is involved, etc. So this is a very simple, um, I'm not an expert in this area, but I can just show you this functionality. I wanted to show you this functionality. And I would also like to uh, say that this will be be improved uh, you will have more options here so uh thanks milza we are a bit uh, behind the schedule so perhaps we can continue with the 
with the next really, really important uh, element, I think, uh, again, this is something that we will just uh, shortly touch. And there was uh, something that was uh, discussed in also in the Providers Day. But one of the topics that we are continuing with is uh, onboarding. So Milica, if you want to... So it's me again. And it's will, you again. And yeah, then, and I will yeah, share the, the presentation. This is what this won't be a technical presentation. So this will uh, I will just try to explain the the main uh, the main concepts uh, related to to the onboarding. So the onboarding, well, this is for many people this is a new term. What does onboarding mean? Onboarding means actually integrating your service, getting your service to the EOS uh, catalog and marketplace. So this is a process and you as a provider must follow this process to register this resource there. And there are some requirements involved. So this process is different. We use the same term onboarding, but for me, it might be more clear if we use, for example, harvesting for, uh, for the resources in the open air research graph, etc. But we use the same term onboarding and it has different meanings for research products, for services and data sources and for training resources. You will hear more about this on Thursday, if I'm, if I'm correct. Uh, this is uh, still work in progress, so I won't be explaining the onboarding of training resources. Procedures are still being developed. So this procedure is basically different for research products and services and data sources. So if you are onboarding research products, you as a provider, it, this means researcher or an institution, you have some research products, publications, etc. And you need to make these products available in some repository that will be eventually harvested by open air. And in order to be harvested by open air, our repository has to meet some requirements. It has to conform to a specific metadata schema. It has to conform with these open air guidelines. And it also should be a trustworthy repository, which means that there is a serious institution behind it, that it has a policy, that it actually its uptime is uh, okay. It's, it's not off and on and off all the time. So you need to uh, make sure that your uh, research products reach eventually the open air research graph. Then the open air provides this information, the metadata to the EOS catalog and marketplace. And this is this one segment discover research outputs in the uh, catalog and marketplace. The procedure for services is different. There are basically two parts. One is a direct onboarding on, uh, through the catalog and marketplace, through the dashboard on the EOS portal. And the other is through some regional and thematic catalogs. You know that uh, uh, in the Infra EOS 5V projects, regional projects, and also projects such as shock thematic projects, uh, catalogs of services were created. And I've already mentioned this. So uh, this is the second part that you onboard your services uh, to these uh, smaller catalogs. And then uh, these, because they're interoperable, they can be harvested and actually pushed forward to the EOS catalog and marketplace. So there is a procedure if you want to onboard. Uh, I won't explain this procedure in detail. There will, be, there will be separate training, very detailed for providers, but you need to register as an EOS provider. So representative should log in and then add a provider. And then this team, uh, the EOS portal onboarding team, EPOT, as we call it, should check the provider to verify the provider. Then uh, when the provide, you're verified as a provider, you will onboard uh, the institution, and then you will onboard the first service. And after the first service is onboarded, the EPOT team will check whether it is okay or not. And all the other services, that will be onboarded by you will be automatically accepted because it's somehow assumed that you, you know how to do, to do this and that you actually meet these requirements. So these are ba basically two parts that have to be done. So you see this difference between research products and services, it's uh, present throughout the, the portal in the way the metadata look, in the way the, the procedures apply. That's it. So uh, inclusion criteria for services, because the, the research products are harvested, so there are no separate inclusion criteria. Open air as a provider has to meet some criteria. 
There are some inclusion criteria. I won't explain all of them, but as I've already mentioned, this technological readiness is very important. Uh, also the targeted communities, etc. But it's also important that some key information must be provided in English. This might change in some later stages, but at this moment, it's uh, it's the only feasible way to to do to like this to provide. For example, you have terms of use and privacy policies. This information has to be uh, in English, and also. There are use rules of participation. You have a link to this document. This is some minimal set of clear rules that you have to, uh, to respect and requirements to meet. And also there is a tool that can help you meet these, uh, these requirements. So this is how an onboarded service looks. As I, I've already explained this. I won't go through, through these metadata. So you can see the technological readiness level and all the metadata here. And uh, one of the most important questions is how trainers can help with onboarding, because trainers are often not technical people. Most trainers are, come from libraries, so they can't really help with some technical issues. Uh, there are many ways that trainers can help. First of all, you should be able to explain the benefits. Why? What's the added value? Uh, what, you, what do the service providers get? Uh, how actually users uh, can access more easily uh, the uh, some service or some uh, some resource if it's available on the catalog uh, use catalog and marketplace. Also, uh, it's very important, uh, and this is this moment of quality control and curation. You as a trainer can help uh, uh, improve the metadata at the source. So you can use, you can actually train researchers how to make res their research outputs fair. Because if you look at the Zenodo records uh, now in the catalog and marketplace, you will see that some of them are not perfect. They're quite far from perfect. So it's very important to be aware of this, that the quality should be controlled in, uh, when we are speaking about uh, research products, quality should be controlled at, at the source. So you as a trainer can help improve this quality. Also, you can uh, train libraries and institutions how to integrate institutional repositories with open air. This is very important. In Serbia, we are doing this quite systematically. So uh, this is a, an area where you can contribute a lot. Also, you can uh, help service providers understand the inclusion criteria and the importance of the inclusion criteria that actually it's very important to fill out all these mandatory fields and to collaborate within the institution to provide this information. You can also help them locate the, the guidelines and training resources. They are available on the EOSC portal. So you, you should be able to help them navigate through these resources. I'm sharing a few links here uh, because uh, apart from the providers hub on the EOSC portal, very, very useful resource is uh, these, uh, the recording and the, all the presentations from, the, from an event organized uh, last uh, spring. Uh, it, it was EOS Providers Days. So have all these recordings and very good presentations that they can make it really clear to providers how to, to follow the, the guidelines and how to, to do the onboarding. So that's all from me for today. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was a really good discussion. Uh, Pauline, yes, uh, a short question, and then uh, let's continue with two more presentations. Yeah, yeah. I have my uh, onboarding of providers question. Um, yes, please. What people have been, have been facing on our side is that, um, so the providers that, that are for resources can be very big institution, like EMBL can be a provider. What we have been facing is that um, our technical staff that that is from EMBL, for example, and that wants to onboard the resources, uh, do not have the admin rights from EMBL to onboard their resources and do not know who to contact to be able to actually onboard their resources that come from a big institution. And they are, as the service provider is already there, they do not know how to handle that. I take a EMBL, it was the case for CSIC as well, or for CNRIs in France, that are big, big institutions. Um, a, and I would like to know how we are supposed to handle that. Uh, this is definitely not a question for me, but I believe that we have Paolo or someone from the team or Venkat. Malaysia. I, 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 I,
there was a reprioritization where we take the content from the um, from the actual related complications element and not from what maybe if there's text in the related so we cannot hear it so I don't know somebody's can you hear me yes yeah Joshua but there's also some voice in the back oh okay it's it, it's it's my colleague in the office sorry about that <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. So um, I'm trying to, uh, there's no input team in the, uh, in the call, but um, I'm, uh, let me try to answer that uh, based on my own experience. So, um, or experience from CESTA. So when you onboard, uh, so if the organization onboard, there's someone who onboards. So that person becomes the first administrator for the provider. And luckily, um, the EOX portal has a functionality where you can add as many administrators as possible. So you can invite, you can, uh, you can, uh, so the first administrator who on board. Um, so if you don't know, then perhaps you should find out who the administrator for that big organization is. So he would then go in and then try to invite the developer as a new administrator, and then he will be able to. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to point out that, you know, if you're working from a small administration, it's quite easy, but sometimes the person that was the first person to onboard a service, for example, for EMBL, in that case, might not include a lot of big EMBL people, but that just put his name and the name of some of the developers of his team, and it ends up being the contact people for a big institution, and no one has a clue about who these people are. So it, it's one of the flaws that, uh, well, I'm calling it a flaw. It's just uh, one okay. of the that we have been facing is that for very big institution of providers, this is complicated for our people. Uh, so, do not, yeah. So what I would suggest is that you write to the airport team and then they will be able to identify who the administrator is and they will give you the administrator's email and you can contact that person. They have been trying that. They have been trying to contact the institution higher up to be able to be added as an additional provider. It's just when you are facing, I don't know if some of you know this thing, but if you're facing a very big administrative institution, this can be a very slow process with very little response. Yeah, uh, Berlin, just to tell you, so uh, yeah, it's, it's the same case when you're working with a university that has a faculty that has a research institute that need to onboard something. So I think this is something that, that we see in, in, in many institutes that are larger, that it will take a process to define who is the top admin. And, but this is something that probably needs to be defined in the institute itself. However, I, I do agree with you, and I would also like to see a bit of a recommendation of the workflow, uh, also from, from EOSC side, uh, how, you know, uh, what are the possibilities here, but, but it does seem to be the case that this will need to be agreed in this institution first. Um, and yeah, it, it makes different when you're a smaller um, research center or when you're part of a, of a larger um, admin for that. Um, I see that there are yeah, some, some discussions, but I think an onboarding is something uh, that was part of the EOS Providers Day, so you could see the recording, but it's also something that we know that is an um, important topic, people are looking forward, and, and we should probably uh, repeat uh, um, trainings uh, for, for, for these uh, cases specifically, so uh, we'll do it in, in the back. Uh, Joshua, perhaps I can continue with my slides and, and then uh, you can do uh, okay. yours. If I can just ask also the, um, the ho our host to, to add, uh, to give Joshua also the co-host right, so he will be able to share the screen in a few minutes, but let me continue um, with, with these parts. Um, so um, we heard quite a lot um, about EOSC already. And I would just like to, to, to put this um, together. And, and this is somehow similar picture that Irina was telling us at the beginning. You just have a bit of um, more um, content uh, in it. Um, so in order for you to understand what we were talking about now and uh, also for some presentation in the future, but also to, to follow us on, on EOSC, I would just like to explain this, uh, this image. Uh, so what we are talking about is that we have three 
primary uh, components. Uh, so one is EOS core that you see here in the bottom. Uh, and then another one is EOS exchange that you can he see here in the top. And the third one is uh, EOS interoperability framework which you see on the right side that is actually linking these two. And yes, we are trying to put uh, together uh, different uh, support activities uh, for, for the EOS core and EOS exchange as well. So just to briefly also say something about these parts. Uh, so EOS core, uh, so when we talk about EOS core, we are so talking about set of services that are providing the means to discover, share, access and reuse data and uh, services. So basically, in short, is basically to operate the, the EOSC itself. And they include parts as, as portal, resource catalog, um, provider portal, uh, federation of authentication, uh, etc. And some of these elements will be also discussed uh, uh, now in the, in the near future. So um, the key value here is to have a um, uh, homogeneous, homogeneous user experience uh, in the EOS itself. And, and then when we're talking about uh, EOS interoperability framework, uh, we're talking about a framework um, uh, which, is the, which is there to uh, provide uh, guidelines on how to connect the services to EOS core and EOS exchange. And in the future, we expect interoperability framework to help linking services with data and, and to compose uh, services all together. And I think some of these was also discussed uh, previously uh, by, by Melissa. So these are kind of the guidelines uh, th that we have on how to prepare everything to put it there. And then about the EOS exchange, um, these are resources and services uh, that are onboarded and registered to EOSC uh, to serve the user. So this is, these are coming from the communities, the cluster, research infrastructures, etc., and also data via, via repositories. Um, so again, all of this was explained, I think, through different slides that Milica showed, but just to uh, let you know how, how actually this is glued uh, together. And uh, when we're talking about uh, EOS core, we are actually talking about some of these services uh, that we have here listed. So single sign-on, uh, again, this is something that, that was presented, and then order management, uh, the help desk, the monitoring and accounting. So these are the services that are being developed now through EOS uh, future uh, projects as it is. And uh, perhaps just a, a view of how these uh, different layers um, integrate um, with EOS Core platform. So we have different, different resources. Um, when we're talking about service catalog, I think what, what was presented is that we have services um, and we have catalogs and data resources, but then you have also um, um, research products catalog when you're talking about data sets, publications, and software. Uh, so basically what you as a provider do is onboard the service in the catalog. You make sure uh, that um, your service or data or any other resource is actually uh, visible. Uh, then you need to define uh, what are the access um, basically rights. Uh, to that services and also what Milica was presenting is that some of them are open, some need uh, a bit more um, access. Um, then you also can publish uh, research um, product metrics. So this is also one of the, the services that is this is available. Uh, you can do you know all the other three services. You can do the, the monitoring, help desk, and order management. And I think I have a bit of a slides because I will not be too long since we are running out of time. Um, so I think most of things uh, related to, to um, AI was already explained. It basically enables us to sign into a range of services with the same account. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are talking about accessing different uh, elements with the same account. So you don't need to register three times if you're using different services. Uh, so for the use case, like a researcher from Panos can access an escape uh, resource with Panos uh, identity. Um, and this is really useful. So I don't need to, you know, sometimes find and save three different user 
um, um, accounts and, and trying to access a service. So this is something that is, that is linked here in EOSC. Um, another element that will be uh, more in detail explained uh, just now um, after me uh, from by my colleagues is EOSC Help Desk. Uh, this is a tool uh, for providers to interact with the, with the users. Um, it widens the service reach and the use base and saves time and money for running their own help desk. So you can use something that is prepared by, by EOSC. And yes, uh, I think it, it goes the same um, with different other services that in this way, users have a common and consistent um, uh, experience uh, with the tool. And uh, just also to mention uh, monitoring. Um, so uh, service monitoring keeps an eye on the performance of IT services and quickly detects an issue. Uh, it monitors the system status, availability, and reliability of, um, of services. And also to mention accounting as, as one of the core services that is being developed. Um, actually, uh, yeah, accounting, is measuring uh, some of the usage, but as Milza also was saying, it will also depend uh, when these will uh, the sources will come from. But um, just in, in short, it uh, complements existing citation mechanism, and is something that uh, is being offered um, as a service because not everything has has this um, in in the bag. Uh, I didn't want to go in, in depth in, in different uh, core services because they are recordings available from the providers days and we'll share that also um, as links uh, together with the, with the slides and I would like to encourage you all to, to go there and uh, also um, discuss this um, as, as trainers, you know, uh, with your colleagues, what, what is uh, a service that could be useful in, in your case. And um, with this, I uh, would like to give the floor to Joshua. So I'm hoping in between. Uh, I think I, I still cannot share because still I'm cannot be share. So yeah. what we could do is that if you could share and then uh, share the slides and then I can. Yeah, OK, you. I think you're now a co-host, Joshua, if you want to do oh, that, okay. but I can also. All right, all right, I'll, I'll share that. Let me share that. Uh, but I can also do it if it's easier. No, 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 I'm sharing. Okay. I, can yeah. you all see my screen now? Yeah, it's coming. Just uh, put on a slide share. Yeah, note. On a slideshow on the top. Yeah. But they do have, they do have passwords. So yeah. So thanks. We can see. Thank you. Okay, you can see my yeah. screen now. Okay, yes. thank you very much, Irina. So, um, my, uh, uh, my name is Joshua, as Evina said, um, he talked about the core services and uh, today I'm going to present to you in the view of a research infrastructure, how we're able to integrate into the EOS help, help desk and also share our use cases and how our impression is with the help desk so far. So we are from SESTA and then SESTA is a consortium for European social sciences and our aim is to uh, enable research community to conduct very high quality research in the social science domain. And we have 22 members, one, observe in, uh, one, ob uh, one observer uh, country in, uh, in across Europe. We have a no number of services that we, we run uh, internally before uh, EOS, we've managed to onboard three of our services. Um, CDC, SESTA Data Catalog is our uh, research engine for, for research data uh, for, uh, for social sciences. And then we have our Motilingua uh, Tizaros for social sciences also onboarded. And also Data Management Expert Guide is a guide that guides uh, research, researchers on how they, they can make their uh, research data and material fair. Fair means findable, uh, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, we do have, we have managed to be able to integrate into EOS core services. And um, we, as uh, Irina has already mentioned, what the use of the monitoring is. Uh, one of the uses we wanted to be able to see if our 
our services that we provided be able to match match up into our service level agreement that we we offer to our services that uh, it is available and reliable and we have some numbers and, and data to back that. That's why we, we decided to call the monitoring services. And also uh, we have help desks, help desks that I will talk a bit more uh, about that in, 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 in a minute. So for us as SESTA, we do have people who manage each of our services. We call them SESTA service owners. A sister service audience, their job is to make sure that there's, the services is fit for purpose. Fit for purpose uh, actually means that they ensure that the services meet the needs of the customer. For use also means uh, to ensure that uh, the services are available as when the users or the customers need them. So now you can now see why we need the monitoring and the help desk as the two interfaces that were able to help us to make uh, those, uh, to be able to manage the services also to effectively deliver a, a service to our customers or our users. So with the EOS uh, help desk, we do have use case. Uh, one of the use cases that we should be able to manage our incidents. So we don't uh, lose track of any incident that happened. Often uh, before this help desk, we used to have uh, email, the traditional emails. And we all know when we are being flooded by emails, we, we sometimes lose track of some of the incidents that, that happened. So we need a tool that will help us to keep track of some of these, uh, some of the incidents that comes and help them to resolve them and also give feedback to whoever created the, in, create the incident. Another use case is also very familiar to uh, most research infrastructure, which is also the service requests. Uh, when we do have a service request, for example, we, we have our uh, SESTA data catalog. When there is a data repository who really wanted to integrate into our, our, our data catalog, they can send service requests. We also need a tool or a, a, a tool to be able to effectively uh, manage those requests. And then third, uh, which is also not quite different from the traditional use of the help desk, but we, we kind of try to use the help desk to uh, help us to gather feedback or um, a feedback that will fit into uh, to improve our services. So, I mean, we don't only get feedback for internally, we also are open to get feedback from users and the customers that uses our services. So when they use our services and they, they are giving us feedback, we, we feed in that feedback into our service development to, for a new improvement of our service. So we also need the, the help desk for that. Uh, how do we implement that? Uh, so in, in implementation, we try to model the use cases that we did mention already. And then in modern the use cases, we, we then need uh, a framework. In this time run, we, we, are, we, we use FITSM. So those of you who are familiar with uh, IT service management, uh, so FITSM is similar to some other framework like ITEL, Cobot, that um, provides series of practices and procedures for aligning our operations and services. So, um, so we chose uh, FITSM because uh, uh, it's, it's simple to use and straightforward. It's very lightweight as compared to some other frameworks. And also it's more tailored towards research infrastructure. So it's more aligned to what we are doing. And one of the other reasons is that EOX as a whole is also the de facto standard that you use. So, I mean, when there are terms and, tech, and, and terminologies within the fit essence, then we could also uh, use that, then, it, then we are actually in line with some of the terms and terminologies that EOS is using, because EOS actually uses us, use that standard for managing its services and its operations. And it has a lot of templates, because of standard, it has a lot of templates that we can easily import and then use them. So, and one of the processes or the procedure within the FITSM is incident and service, 
request management and incident request management has some procedures. One of them is uh, it records classify, it, it tells us how we can record, classify and, and prioritize issues or requests that comes. It also helps us to provide overview of our incidents and then helps in the overall management of our incident and request management. And uh, within the incident and service okay. request management, we actually need a tool because it itself cannot be managed, right? So we, you will need a tool to manage that. And that is how can we need EOX help decks for. So we, um, we, we contact EOX, EOX for EOX uh, help decks as a service. And then they were able to create um, something like an instance where we can have our own interface and we can be able to manage our own groups and queues and do some other configuration by ourselves without actually relying on uh, EOX to do that for us. So that's uh, that's the use case for for which why why we contacted EOX for that. And then, so in in operation, it's uh, for our typical useful uh, workflow for helping us to manage our workflow in Cesta. Is for example, so we have a user in front. The user has two ways of sending ticket or request. So he can either send a ticket via our support assessor.eu or towards our, we've also integrated into our services. We have web forms that we have integrated into our web form. So we can also send a request or incident through uh, the services. So once that it go, then it goes into, so when it, sub, when it submits through the support, it goes our first help desk, and then we received it, or you can also send it through the, the service feedback, and that goes directly into our services, either CDC or CD or CDS or S or any of the services directly into the service owner. So the service owner will have notification that there is an incident, and then he will be able to act upon it. And then one of the things that uh, can be able to do within some of the groups or the first line service or the, the or the services groups where so for example if there are tickets that finds its way into uh, the first line that actually belongs to say CDC group then they can be we can easily move those tickets from the first line support into the into the services group uh, uh, the services group so the service units we go to manage it and vice vice versa. So we can actually do that. And then from that end, the first the service owner or the first line will then need to go through some workflow. You classify them. So if it's incident, you classify them to incident. If it's service, if it's if the issue is it's a service request, you classify them to service request. And then if it is an incident, classify them to incidents. And then he will then prioritize whether the incident is major or minor or medium or low. He prioritizes them as such. And then he assigned them to whoever is responsible for that issue. So he assigned it to uh, that person. And then the person will take, uh, take care of it and then try to resolve them. So after that is resolved, a feedback then is being sent to the user that the issue is being resolved. But there are, there are cases that I have not actually uh, demonstrated here where issues, we, 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 where, where if the issue is delayed or there's some problem, then we do have process we call escalation process. So there's another process called escalation process that we use the help desk to model that if, for example, uh, we receive a ticket that lasted for more than seven days and it has not been acted upon, then there is uh, an, an escalation. The escalation then will, an email will be sent to an, a, a higher uh, person or an email will be sent to anyone within the group of the services to to notify them that this issue has not been added on them, so they should add on. So there's, there's another process as well that we have not demonstrated yet that we can actually we use the help desk for. So, 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 so far, uh, what is our impression so far with the help desk? So um, it's 
quite flexible in our view. Uh, yeah, flexible in the sense that we can, it is easy to uh, configure for you. So for example, we can change workflow so we can design our own workflows and then we can add or delete or take off workflows that we think they are not necessary or things that we think are necessary. We can add additional workflows if we want to. Then we do have work form like I did explain. So there's a work form already uh, developed by EOX that we can easily import into our services. And then anyone who wanted to send tickets directly, that ticket will be directly be sent into our service uh, uh, can be sent directly into the services, uh, uh, the service owners uh, that manages that we respective service. So if we have uh, uh, various services that we do have, when we have that form, any, any ticket that you have can be sent directly into uh, that group and that will be added upon. Then, like I, I did said, we, we use that one. It's so good for us to use it to manage our escalation procedures. And there are other filtering. So one of the issues that we do have that uh, with our support at cesta.eu is an email that we even we've used it to subscribe to some other services. So there are things that comes into it that automatic creates tickets into our into our system. And that is uh, that becomes um, a spam for us. So we, we, there is a way that we can, we can filter that. So if as soon as that email comes, it will not unnecessarily take it for us. And this is another benefit that we, we've seen from the help that that is so beneficial to us. And of course, uh, reporting at the end of the day, if you want to know how many tickets that we resolve within a time frame, you can use that reporting. Uh, tool to tell you uh, where the ticket is coming from, uh, from which group, and then for how long tickets have been resolved, and on and on. So there's a reporting mechanism for that. And so that's our impression so far. And uh, with that, I uh, that's the end of my presentation. If there's any other question that you will need to ask me or uh, any general question at all with regards to the help desk. Uh, there is uh, the lead uh, person within EOS, uh, Pavel is within this call. He, he may be able to answer in the yeah. limited. Uh, uh, thank question. you, Joshua. So so um, I'll allow one question. So if somebody wants to raise their hand and, and ask some of the the really, really, uh, you know, ur uh, urgent element because I know that uh, people want to need to leave to to other meetings. So if there's something, um, however, also I would like to add that we are just in the discussion to have um, a help desk related session for the uh, for the providers in January. Uh, so uh, keep following information on the EOSC uh, future um, event site. Uh, for that, and also if you want to point it to your uh, to your providers, uh, so if there are no any any urgent elements, I would just then like to to close uh, this session, and would like to um, so Joshua and Powell will be available for for questions. We'll share also the the, the contact emails for for the teams in, in case there's something to to be asked. Uh, but also, I would like to invite you to um, to join us tomorrow for the day three, when we will be addressing the legal and ethical issues related uh, to using uh, EOSC, and then also day four, which is Thursday, uh, when we will be uh, discussing more about uh, the uh, training, uh, so crafting your own training using EOS Knowledge Hub and uh, and other resources. Uh, so with that, I would uh, like to close uh, the session and um, see you tomorrow or at the, at the other events and, and meetings. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us uh, today. Thanks.